to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her What devotion. the hell is going on? Hey. Everybody, <laughs> this is what happens when everybody joins Zoom at the same time. We we get an insight into what's happening in uh yeah in everybody's lives. So I just want to do a quick check. Give me uh give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, if you can see me. Let me make sure everything's working. All right, awesome. I see some familiar faces. Uh, people are still joining. So while we're waiting for everybody to join us, if you could just type into the chat where you're joining from because i know we've got people from all over the world here today so it'd be really really cool uh to see where uh you're all joining from so yeah just enter into the chat so i see venezuela elena says she's in school rio de janeiro in brazil that's jonathan jonathan it is one of my dreams to go to uh brazil and i've heard rio is uh amazing so i'm very jealous we've got wales in the uk windsor portugal which is one of my favorite places on earth uh sweden calls in sweden awesome uh south korea we've got paul in manchester paul good to see you man um laura in brooklyn new york wow this is really really awesome um let me see we've got uh, amira in tunisia amira from linkedin really really cool to see you here uh, serbia calling kind of like the eurovision <laughs> a little bit um Awesome. All right, cool. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to jump into the presentation. I'll just make sure everything's working okay. I'll tell you uh, you all what the plan is. And then, uh, yeah. So if, if that sounds good, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. And uh, yeah, we still got some uh, some people joining. Awesome. All right. So first test. Can you all see my screen? Oh, wonderful. Okay. All right. Awesome. I always, whenever I have to depend on technology a little bit, there's always that little bit of anxiety that everything will work perfectly right up until you actually go live. So, so that's really great. Everything is working uh, so far. So as you can see, uh, the topic here is really about unlocking, maximizing your earning potential as uh, an ESL teacher. So the uh, agenda who is this presentation for? Well, I think there are really three categories of teachers who will benefit from what I'm about to, to share today. The first is ESL teachers who want to learn how they can earn better hourly rates. So I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with that price ceiling that it seems to be really hard to get over for ESL teachers. And then it's even worse now online where it seems like there's almost this race to the bottom with people undercutting each other to get cheaper, to offer cheaper and cheaper classes. So I want to show you how to escape it. Um, next is teachers who want to learn how to make their online lessons more engaging. So of course, when you, when you teach online, you, you can unlock this whole new world of possibilities. So it's really, really important we take advantage of the tools of the technology available now to make our lessons as engaging as possible. And finally, teachers who want to learn how to position themselves online. And this is really important, how to position yourself. So you're not one of those, you know, $10 an hour teachers, students, your potential students can see, hey, this person has something really, really valuable to offer. They can see you're worth a premium and they'll be happy to, to pay you that. So maybe I'm a little bit ambitious with this, but uh, I, I really, I set a target. I want to pack as much value into this as possible. So we're going to start with the one shift that changed everything for me. And this was absolutely pivotal in breaking through that traditional TEFL 
price ceiling and increasing uh, my hourly rate. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about creating engaging online material to help you stand out from all those other teachers offering online classes. And finally, I want to talk about positioning yourself online to attract those high paying students. Uh, I'm going to be sharing what's worked for me, what I've learned, but I'm also going to be sharing a lot of the mistakes I've made to hopefully shortcut the process for you to speed things up. So uh, yeah, you know, I made the mistakes. So you won't have to. So uh, if that sounds good, just give me a thumbs up. Let me know you're still with me. All right, awesome. I'm going to have a quick check at all your faces just to see. All right, okay. Awesome. All right, okay. I see a few smiley faces. That's always uh, always a good thing. Uh, great. So uh, a little bit about my background. Now, I, I do recognize some of you, so I don't want to bore you, uh, but I'll give you a quick introduction just uh, because there are some new, uh, some new names, some new, new faces here too. So uh, my journey, it started in an ESL classroom back in 2013. Uh, it was really a job I just kind of fell into. I finished college. I did a bit of traveling. I came back and my sister said, well, why don't you do the, the CELTA? You know, and you can do that while you figure out what you want to do. So I said, OK, sounds like, a, you know, a good plan. Uh, it's better than what I was doing, which was, you know, stacking shelves in a supermarket. So I did it. I gave it a go on, uh, yeah, what was meant to be a temporary thing, you know, seven, eight years later, I progressed, I became an assistant director of studies, to be honest, I just fell completely uh, in love with the, the job and my role evolved to become a teacher trainer, I was very fortunate, I got invited to other countries to give talks to teachers about uh, using technology, making lessons more engaging. So yeah, this thing I fell into turned out to be, you know, really a dream job in many ways, but it wasn't without frustration. Of course, you know, like I said, it's not the most lucrative job in the world. I felt a little bit like I hit a ceiling and I couldn't progress. And then in 2020, this thing came along it's so long ago. I can't even remember. Did something happen in 2020? Was there some like event or anybody know? Yeah. So, you know, the whole world changed in my country, all yeah, the language pandemic. schools closed uh yes we said the pandemic of course yeah so we had uh we had the pandemic we had covid uh my situation changed pretty drastically and although i liked my job i was starting to get that little bit frustrated so this these lockdowns this pandemic it was really that push i needed to go out into the online space you know to, to see okay let me flex some of these entrepreneurial muscles and see if i can make my own situation work you know so i won't have to depend on schools anymore and believe me there was a lot of trial and error all right it wasn't just this straight trajectory to success i'm going to be sharing a lot of the mistakes a lot of the wrong things i did that if i could go back i wouldn't do them and i'm going to show you eventually what i learned i was fortunate i crossed paths with some amazing mentors who really helped me i'm going to share what i learned how i refined it and how i made it work for me so hopefully all of you and uh yeah enjoy the same Success. So eventually I was very fortunate. I got to a point where I took my monthly earning purely as a freelance ESL teacher online up to uh, just over 5,000 euro uh, a month, which I think is, I don't know, maybe 5,300, $400, uh, which kind of freed me up, you know, it gave me, it opened up this new world of opportunity. I started to travel. I moved to Portugal. I went to Mexico. I had a great time. And then one of my mentors from early in my journey came back to me and uh, we had a few conversations and I said, hey, you know, I've learned a few of these things. I think this can help. And he said, OK, it would be interesting if you came on board. We started to collaborate. Some of you guys might know him. His name is uh, James Liu. And we started off collaborating, but eventually he brought me into the fold fully uh, into his business Bowie strategy. And since then, I have made it my mission to help as many ELT professionals as possible, as many teachers as possible to save time and earn more working online. Um, and that brings me here to this uh, webinar today. So hopefully I didn't put anybody to sleep uh, with my with my background. Hopefully we're all still good. Just give me a thumbs up, a wave in the camera if you're still with me or a yes in the chat. Uh, awesome. All right. Fantastic. Cool. So let's uh, let's get into the let's get into the good stuff. 
So like I said, I made a lot of mistakes. And one of the big mistakes I made early on was when I moved online, when I became independent, I was offering classes. I was selling lessons, individual lessons, right? And, and the price I decided was 20 euro an hour. I eventually got it up to 25 euro an hour. And then I, that was it. I just couldn't get past that. And another downside of offering classes was I was working with students who had different levels, different needs, different challenges. They needed a different attention, different focus on different areas. And ultimately they had different goals. And what does that mean for the teacher? A little bit of work or a lot of work? Quite, I mean, we all know about lesson planning, right? It was, it was a lot of work. So I had a couple of students, I was making 20 to 25 euro an hour, but really each lesson was, was two or even three hours of my time in terms of preparation, organizing, scheduling the next classes. And another thing about individual lessons, when you just offer classes, your student could turn around to you and say, all right, uh, yeah, my situation has changed or I won't be able to make next week's lesson. You're really very much at the mercy uh, of, of circumstances beyond your control. So it wasn't a very reliable way to work. It wasn't sustainable. So the thing that really changed everything for me was, well, anybody know? Anyone want to stab a guess? Let me know in the chat. Bonus points if anyone gets it, uh, it right. <laughs> Jelena says, actually, you've been super brief. I think that was about my story. So that's, that's good to know. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So that's good to know. Sue says programs. Yeah, well, Sarah says groups. Actually, that came a little bit later, but for sure, that was a more efficient way of working too. But I, absolutely, it was programs. And when I say programs, someone actually messaged me on LinkedIn earlier this week and, and they said, Robbie, I know you talk about programs, but I don't want to just record my lessons. I want to be there with my students. But when I say program, I'm not talking about, you know, pre-recorded. I'm talking about live lessons. But what a program means is a set number of lessons, a focused amount of lessons that help your learner achieve specific goals within a time frame. So now you're not selling an individual class at an hourly rate. You're selling a package that is specifically designed to help your student get results they want within a time frame. And for the teacher, it's a much more efficient way to work, but also for the student. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that now. So I've just uh, drawn up this little table just to illustrate the differences between selling a classes and selling a program, working a class-based system or using a program based approach. Now classes is pretty much always going to be different material for each student, right? Like I said, different levels, different needs. With the program, for the most part, the material is going to stay the same because remember, it's focused on solving particular challenges. So that means instead of new material constantly being created, existing material can be recycled and it can be refined, right? So when you go through a lesson with one of your students, you can think, mm, okay, that worked really well. I'm going to keep that in. This activity, it, mm, I think I, I gave too much time there or I could have done this differently. So your material is constantly evolving. It's getting better all the time. With classes, student results can vary, right? I mean, I know there are some wonderful, wonderful teachers there, but I think we all have our strengths and weaknesses right? Some of us excel with the higher levels, B2, C1. Some of us, you know, have that patience for the lower levels. But if you're teaching everybody, you're spread pretty thin. You know, you're going to be working with students who you're really good at working with, but some students who, you know, it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of work. Uh, so again, with a program, the material is more focused. So your students get better results. And ultimately teaching classes, far more prep time. With a program, sure, you need to create the material long-term you're going to save a lot of time lesson planning, you know, and I talked about my own teaching business. I got to a point where my lesson planning time, it was about five to 10 minutes before the lesson started because I knew the student, they had a set program. I just needed to make a few little tweaks. Maybe they made some mistakes in the last classes. All right, I'm going to do a little bit of revision on their mistakes at the start of the lesson. That was it. There was no reinventing the wheel or creating new lessons from, uh, from scratch anymore with the program uh so just if that makes sense just give me a thumbs up a wave let me know you're you're still with me we're good all right uh, people are still smiling that's always a good thing really really good to see all right brilliant so uh now i i 
touched on why a program is more beneficial for the teacher. Here's why from a business sense, it makes a lot more sense too. Most of your students, they don't just want to learn English for fun, right? They have a reason. Maybe there's an exam they need to pass. So for example, IELTS gets people into college, you know, gets people into jobs in other countries, right? Maybe their company has an English proficiency test. Maybe they want to move to an international company, but the job interview is English, right? These are the underlying motivations people have for wanting to improve their English. And with these underlying motivations, they usually have specific problems with their English that stop them from reaching these goals. So some examples here, lack of confidence. You know, I've lost count of the amount of times a student told me a lack of confidence, but we can get even more specific than that. When they go into those uh, conference calls or those Zoom meetings or those face-to-face -face meetings, they have so little confidence and they're not sure they have the vocabulary to express themselves that they don't speak up. They don't give the best account of themselves. The opportunities pass them by. They can't excel in their, in their jobs. Maybe they work with, you know, well, I'm Irish, right? And um, I think notoriously Irish people, you know, we don't have the easiest accent to understand. I don't know, you know, it seems like you're following my accent okay for everybody here. All right, let me look at your faces. Let me make sure you're telling the truth. All right, okay, okay. So it, it's neutralized a bit over, over the years, but I know from speaking to students, maybe they have colleagues from certain cities with a strong accent, and just the thought of having to communicate with them terrifies them. So if you have this program, hey, we're going to practice understanding different accents, native speakers, that becomes so, so valuable to your learners. So... Brings us to the final point. If your program solves these problems and helps your students move closer to their ultimate goal, better jobs, moving abroad, getting that promotion, how valuable does it become in their eyes? I would argue more valuable than 20 euro, 25 euro an hour. I mean, what's a new job worth to someone? What's a promotion? And if your program, if your classes help move them closer, Look, you're not promising a new job, but you're gearing your classes to help them get closer to that goal becomes very valuable. And that's a key point. If you want to break free from that threshold, that typical general English teacher price ceiling, this is the shift you've got to make. All right. Now, brings us to the next point. So one of my mentors told me early on that you can earn $100 an hour teaching English. And I don't know about you but my first reaction was to put it politely i was skeptical <laughs> to put it not politely you know probably you know had some vulgar language in in my head i thought it was a scam i thought there was no way you know at eight years nine years in the industry at this point i knew the way things worked in tefl so number one i thought it was impossible then i learned okay it's not a class it's this focused program this package you're offering but still the program it's only 10 hours, typically, maybe it's 12 hours, maybe it's eight hours. Let's say one lesson a week, one hour lesson over a period of uh, two and a half months. So that would be a 10 week program, a 10 hour program. How can we justify as teachers charging not just more, but considerably more for this 10 hour program than we were probably selling our classes for before, right? What's the justification? So I want to give you guys an example just to explain this point because this is something I really went uh, through and uh, thinking about it like this really helped me understand and just crystallized it in my mind. Uh, well, what do you see? Just let me know. Let me know in the chat. <laughs> Laura says New York accents are much worse. <laughs> um, Lots of material, frustration to fed up students. Absolutely, lots of material, right? Let's say this student, let's say hypothetically, he has a geography exam next week in his university. He's one week to prepare, doesn't know what's coming up on the exam. He's got all this material to go through. Pretty stressful, pretty time consuming, right? Hey, look, the material is there. It's available. It's probably available for free. You know, pretty much everything is for free on the internet nowadays. But this is the situation he's in. What if someone came along and said, uh, hey, John, 
look, I know you've got that exam coming up. I know you're trying to learn everything. I know you don't have much time. I know you're stressed. I'm actually an expert on that exam. I understand it. I know the questions you get asked and I specialize in helping people get great results in that exam. I've actually gone through all of this material for you and I've carefully selected the most relevant material for you. I'm not going to waste your time. Only the most relevant things that help you get the result you want in that particular exam. So now all of a sudden you don't have to go through 50, 60 books. Hey, I'll put it all together for you in this super focused guide. Maybe it's only like 20, 30 pages, right? In this student's mind, what's more valuable? Like those 50 books in the library or those hundreds of websites or online articles or this carefully put together 30 page guide with only the relevant information to help him get the result he wants in that exam. <laughs> the last choice. Yeah, ab absolutely. So the key point here is as a teacher, as a coach, you really earn your stripes, not by giving more and more material and more lists of phrasal verbs and more exercises and more resources. You earn your stripes by understanding what your student needs, focusing the information and making it as easy as possible for, for them to learn, digest and implement in the in the real world and again that's why these shorter programs actually become more valuable speed and ease are the most valuable things in the world today if you show them if you communicate that your program is designed to get them where they want more quickly and more easily than much longer alternatives working with a general english teacher for example that doesn't decrease the value of your service it doesn't decrease the perceived value it increases the value in their eyes. So going back to this student, you know, in his situation, he's going to pay considerably more for this uh, book. Now, if that makes sense, please give me a thumbs up. Let me know you're still with me because this is one of the most important points uh, we're going to mention uh, today. Awesome. All right, cool. Let me just do a time check. All right, we're 22 minutes in. How, like, how's the energy? Are we still good? All right, thumbs up. Cool. Uh, there's, there's a fox here in the chat. That is pretty cool. If someone has, uh, you know, one of those filters. Nice. All right. Uh, cool. All right. Really, really good. Let, we're flying here. Let's, uh, let's move on. Now, next question. How do you actually build your program? And I know how overwhelming this can, this can see. All right. Okay. I know I should teach a program. I'm going to earn more. It's going to help my students get better results. Where do I start? First point. And again, this was another one of those big shifts. I made before I was trying to teach everybody, students from different countries, different levels, different needs. We need to choose a niche. That's the only way we can make a focused program, right? We can't make a really good program designed to help everybody achieve everything. That's why we need to choose a niche because then when we design our program, we can make sure it helps them overcome, move past their biggest challenges. So let's... Uh, yeah, this, this is just uh, another summary of that point. So general teaching tries to cover everything. Niche teaching focuses on solving specific problems for a specific group. And I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean by niche teaching. So you probably see this a lot on LinkedIn, Instagram, English teacher, ESL teacher, online ESL teacher, right? That's in a student's mind, that's $10, $15, $20 an hour, okay? This is how a niche teacher positions themselves. Let me just change the color here. Uh, English communication skills coach for Italian executives, right? That's what it means to be a niche teacher. You specialize in helping a certain group. And I know from my own experience and from talking to teachers, how intimidating it can be to say, okay, I need to choose a niche. My whole business is depending on this. This is the kind of teacher I'm going to become for the rest of my life. So I something I want to help you out with uh two so just a, a few more points uh first about why online teachers should work with a niche differentiates you from all the other general english teachers out there positions you as an expert or a specialist right hey i don't help everybody i help this group particularly that's my that's where my expertise is being a niche teacher means you have a deeper understanding of the students you work with and a deeper understanding means you can help them achieve better results if you can help your students achieve better results, what does it mean for you? You're worth every penny of that higher price point, right? Just because that, remember that guidebook for, for John back there, it was 40 pages. 
right? Just because it's 40 pages, that doesn't mean it wasn't a lot of work to put those 40 pages together. The real skill was identifying, going through all the other stuff to give the student exactly what he needs to get the result in that exam. And that is worth a higher price point for sure. Okay, so uh, just to highlight this uh, idea of specialist. When I was a kid, uh, I played a lot of football and I got hurt uh, a lot. I got injured all the time. Uh, I don't know. It's probably my own fault. Uh, anyway, whenever I got a, a sports injury, my dad would say, all right, look, you know, it's swollen. We might have to go to the doctor. So he sent me to the local GP, the general practitioner. He didn't have a clue what was wrong with me. Like, that's not his area. That's not his specialty, right? So I, I was going with like a, a sprained ankle or, you know, like a twisted wrist. And the GP you know, he, he was a little bit lost. Usually he'd refer me to somebody else, right? So who's going to give you a better treatment if you have a sports injury? GP or a physiotherapist? Physio, right? Who's going to be more expensive usually? Physio. Better treatment, it's more expensive, but you get better results, right? It's the same with you as a niche teacher. So just to go back to that example, those Italian executives who want better communication skills, Who's going to be the more appealing option for them? The general English teacher charging $10 an hour or the more expensive specialist who literally only works with that particular group, right? They're going to know they're going to get better results with the niche uh, teacher. Uh, Asma says business English teacher is a niche teacher. It's a great question. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, business English teacher was a niche. Nowadays, so many people are doing it that my advice would be to niche down even further. Be a business English teacher for a specific group or a specific nationality or a specific industry uh, or a specific level, okay? Business English teacher, now it actually falls more in that general English category, okay? So is, be as specific as possible. And I'm going to give you some examples on how to do it. So this is the question. I get asked this a ton and I totally understand it because it's the whole process I went through myself. So let me tell you about my mistake uh, first. So when I started doing this whole thing and learned about niche teaching and program-based teaching, I decided, okay, tech, IT, tech, that's the industry I'm going to become a niche teacher in. Why? Well, the industry was booming in my country at the time. You know, everybody was working online during the lockdowns. Uh, and there's a lot of money in it, right? So that was my logic. I'll go tech. Now, what happened when I went tech? Number one, I didn't have the passion. I don't know anything about the tech industry, about IT. I have no background there. And I wasn't particularly excited at the prospect of working with these people. So my motivation was wrong. I, I thought, okay, you know, there's a business there and there's money there. But that, that wasn't the right starting point for choosing a niche. So I went there, I realized there's a lot of work. It's very overwhelming. The amount of research I have to do about this niche is so daunting. And, and pretty much anyone in tech who saw me knew like this guy isn't a specialist. This guy doesn't get it, right? So that was my mistake. I, I, I went with what I thought, where I thought the money would be and what I thought would be a good business. Now, what I learned through a few iterations was what I should have done. I should have made sure the niche I decided to work with ticked these three boxes. Number one, does the prospect of working with these people excite you, right? When you think I'm going to build my business around helping this group of people, like, do you feel it? Like, do you feel that resonate in your heart? Like, does it excite you? Do you feel passion about working with them? And this is the reason I put this as the first box. If the answer is no, every other thing you do in your business is going to feel 10 times harder. Okay, so you've got to start here. Which group am I passionate about helping? Am I excited at the thought of working with these people? Then, of course, hey, it's a business. Like, you know, we're not a charity, right? We're here to make money. We're here to pay bills. Let's, is this group a viable business? Number one, do they have a need for English, let's say communication skills? That's your specialty. Do they have a need? Now, remember, underlying motivation is really important here. So does this group need better English to get better jobs, better opportunities? And number two, can they afford to pay for your program? Of course, this is important too. So I told you I started on tech, quickly realized I wasn't passionate about it, and I just didn't really have any knowledge. So it was very difficult to position myself as a specialist. So what I decided, what do I know? Well, I work in Dublin. In Dublin, 
we have a huge Brazilian community. Most of my teaching career, you know, my classes was usually 70, 80% Brazilian students. And I taught primarily intermediate, upper intermediate level, advanced level sometimes. So, so higher levels. So I said, okay, let's do communication skills for Brazilian professionals. So where did I start? Let's have a look in Brazil. Let's go to Rio de Janeiro. Let's go to Sao Paulo. And let's, you know, find uh, professionals, Brazilian professionals working in these cities. Now, I know, I think it's Jonathan we have in Brazil. So Jonathan, two, three years ago when I was doing this, the exchange rate between the real, uh, the Brazilian currency, and the euro wasn't so good. I think it was five to one. So I was charging. It's worse. It's worse now. <laughs> it's, it's gotten even worse. Uh, so, yeah, I was charging. My starting point for this new business, it was 60 euro an hour, meaning 600 euro for a 10-week, a 10-lesson program. Mm -hmm. Now, for a Brazilian based in Brazil, that wasn't 600 euro from their perception. That was about 2,500 euro. Now, I didn't, did not have the sales skill to, to, to make that kind of sale, to communicate the value. Hey, it was valuable for sure, but I'm not sure it was worth that much to someone. So that was the first mistake I made. So Brazilians based in Brazil wasn't a viable business. But hang on a second. In Dublin, there's a huge Brazilian community. And I knew from working with these people, uh, these Brazilians, that one of their big frustrations was back in Brazil, they were lawyers, they were engineers, they were working in IT. And then they came to Ireland and they try to get jobs in their area. They had all this experience, all these technical skills. What was the missing ingredient? English, right? Hey, they're living in a Western country. Euro is their currency. So now they have a need and they have the financial means to pay. So that's what I mean about ticking both of these boxes. They've got to have the need, but they've also got to have the financial means to pay you what, uh, what you would like to earn, which is, you know, a higher price than the typical general English teacher. So if that makes sense, just give me a thumbs up. Let me know you're still with me. Good. All right. The fox. I think the fox is smiling. Uh, hard to tell. Uh, all right. Cool. We're all still here. Awesome. There's one more box we need to tick, right? And look, this is less important than the other two, but it's still important. Do you have any knowledge and or experience of your niche? The reason this is less important is you can always do research. You can always learn. Hey, we're always learning, right? We're always learning new things. But if you do have that little bit of knowledge, that little bit of background information, right? So working with these Brazilians, I had that bit of insight. I knew English was that missing gap, stopping them from getting those better jobs in their area. So when I positioned myself online, I could speak to that desire. I could show I understood. And it was very, very effective in terms of attracting uh, students. So this all makes sense. Awesome. All right. So when you're thinking about your niche, this is the process I want you to, to go, go, uh, go through. And I see some people making notes. Uh, like if, if I go through a slide too quickly and you don't have time to write everything down, please don't worry. Everyone here is going to get a copy of the uh, recording. So yeah, don't, uh, I don't want to see anyone like frantically taking notes like I used to do in, uh, in college. Um, okay. So how to build your program. It's actually not that complicated. Okay. So remember, now we have a niche. We've got to identify what their three biggest problems or challenges are, right? Once we identify the three biggest challenges, um, let's say hypothetically, one is confidence, right? Let's say having the vocabulary to communicate in important situations and having the confidence to do it, right? Let's say that's one. Number two is uh, job interviews, right? One of their desires is to get a better job, but English job interviews just scare, scare them so much. You know, the thought of answering the questions in English is really difficult. So you're going to help prepare them for job interviews. Number three, uh, let's say writing emails. This was something I got a lot. You know, my students used to tell me, like, I have to write emails to my boss at work and I reread it 10 times before sending it because I'm so anxious. It will accidentally sound rude or like I've made a mistake that will make me look bad. So they're just three examples of, of problems. Obviously, it depends on your, on your niche, right? And there's a little bit of research involved in terms of uncovering them, but I'm going to show you how to, how to do research uh, as well today. And then once you've got the modules, select the lesson material that will help your students reach their goals. And remember, it's not about more. It's about quick and easy. That's where the value is, focused. So, you know, I, I work with some teachers sometimes purely just on 
uh, course creation and lesson planning. And they always tell me, look, Robbie, I'm charging 50, 60, 70, hundred dollars for my class. I want to give them as much as possible. But remember, that's not where you, your value is determined. Your value is determined by giving them what they need. And, and that's more valuable than more, right? Just what they need. Um, okay. Cool. So uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about research because it is so uh, important. So let's say you need to uncover the three biggest challenges. So there are a couple of methods to do research. Uh, and, you know, we have one big one in 2023 that wasn't possible before, which I'm so jealous of you. If you're just starting this journey now, I'm so jealous because if I had this, it would have saved me so much time. Um, so I like this quote, no research without action, no action without research, you know, they really do uh, go together. So how to research for your program? Method one, observe. Now, how do you observe your niche? Well, we have this really cool thing called the internet, right? They're there, they're on it. Where are they? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Facebook, right? So LinkedIn, I think is just an amazing tool and I'm gonna talk more about it. But the cool thing is on LinkedIn, you can search for your niche using filters very easily. The industry, the country, it's all there. It's all available for free. And then you can actually see what they're engaging with, what posts they're liking, what companies they're working for. So you can see all of these things here, what they're talking about, um, who they're following, what posts they're liking. Do you have any competitors as well, right? Is there anyone working in a similar niche? That's not a bad thing, right? If they're doing well, what that means is it's possible. If someone else can do it, you can do it too. And the cool thing is you can learn a lot from observing them. They've already figured out a lot of what works. So find your competitors, learn from them. Um, what are they offering? What problems are they focusing on solving? And then we've also got online forums, you know, Reddit. Uh, I never know how to how to pronounce that word. So I'm gonna embarrass myself and try to pronounce it. Quora, Quora, I think. I don't know. Uh anyway, really useful websites, forums, people ask questions, people give answers all the time. So you can search uh and find out a lot of good information by uh, reading these forms. What are they talking about? What questions are they asking? Now, here's why I'm so jealous of all of you today starting out. ChatGPT came along. And I don't know how you feel about AI and the pros and cons. And, and there's a whole big debate to have there. But the way I look at it now is we've got this lovely window of opportunity where all of this technology is pretty much available for free. They haven't brought it in under, you know, they haven't put the red tape around it yet. It's there for us all to take advantage of right now in this moment. Here's how you can use it to quickly learn about your niche. So here's a prompt you can use in ChatGPT. You can do this today. Tell me about the biggest challenges. We could even add the word three. Here are the three biggest challenges your niche might have when it comes to performing action, your coaching helps it, when it comes to communicating in English in work. So for me, this is what I would have done three years ago. Tell me about the biggest challenges Brazilian managers have when it comes to communicating in English at work. And to be honest, it, it came up with some gold. They are pretty much it came up with the program pillars in 10 seconds that it took me about six months to figure out myself through my own research. So it, it brought up things like cultural differences, technical vocabulary, so industry-specific vocabulary, articulating ideas, negotiating, uh, understanding spoken English, different accents, fast-paced conversations, written communication, expressing their thoughts clearly, uh, emails, reports, presentations. It gave me some really, really good stuff there in about 10 seconds, to be honest. This is gold. And it was very, very similar to what I actually ended up with after six, seven months of research, plus eight years experience as well, working with Brazilians. And when I realized ChatGPT can now just provide it for people instantly, I had some mixed emotions, <laughs> to, to be honest. But I'm happy. I'm happy for you here if you're starting to, to be able to take advantage of this technology. All right. So you've done your research. Now it's time. Let's, let's create the program. Break each of these problems, challenges into the modules or pillars of your program. Each pillar is designed to help your clients overcome a specific challenge. So here's something really similar to what I uh, ended up with. This was kind of my 10 week program that I was offering to students. One lesson a week, the lessons were typically 60 or 70 minutes. First pillar was expanding knowledge of key business English vocabulary. Uh, so especially for communicating in meetings, you know, introducing items, wrapping up, you know, mentioning the agenda, this kind of like functional language that can get them results quickly. I shared a lot of module two, express yourself confidently in presentations. So a lot of my students were nervous about, you know, delivering presentations, speaking in front of their colleagues and three writing professional sounding business emails. They were terrified 
of their written English giving a bad account of themselves or even worse, accidentally coming across as rude because, you know, languages like Spanish and Portuguese, they tend to be a little bit more direct than English. You know, English, we have these lovely little phrases like, would you mind if I, you know, or, um, you know, which it's kind of unusual for a Spanish or, or Portuguese speaker. So when you can actually give them these phrases that later that day they can use, super valuable, you know, way more valuable than a list of 30 phrasal verbs with no context. Okay. And then again, it just goes back to that's where you're going to earn your stripes as, um, as a program-based niche teacher. Okay. I'm going to take a pause. Now, first of all, because I want to catch a breath, but also because I want to check check in with you. So we've got a really, really great attendance here. We've got 36 uh, joining us live. I think nearly 100 registered for the event. So thank all of you for making it live. If you're watching the recording, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, just let me know if you're still with me, if everything makes sense. So far, we've got a wave. Uh, let me see what we've got. We've got Teacher Ali. There's Margaret. Great to see you. Familiar faces. Maggie uh william dennis dennis great to see you uh okay awesome so all right we know our program we've got that map in our mind we know our niche right we've got the plan now we've got to put the material together so when i like searched for you know business english lessons business english material online this is the kind of stuff i was finding and i don't know about you but like how do you feel when you look at this kind of material yeah, so I can see Sue yawning. It's, it's great because I, I think I actually added an emoji. Yeah, I did. Yeah, because that's exactly how, uh, how I felt as well. And, and you know, that's if a student, he, my ultimate aim, now I started at 60 euro, my ultimate aim was 100. If they're paying that much, I just felt, imagine they go to the first lesson and this is what they, this is what they see, you know. So it doesn't really do a lot to, you know, inspire confidence or give that premium feel. To your classes. Now, I was very fortunate. Uh, I mentioned, you know, I had that eight years teaching, nine years almost teaching experience before. For uh, a lot of those years, I worked in a school that had these really cool electronic whiteboards and projectors. And what I learned is instead of like photocopying the textbook, if I put my lessons into PowerPoint slides. As a teacher, it gave me so much more control. Like, I don't know about you, but I used to hate just giving them a page full of information because they can read ahead. They know what's coming next. You know, you, you can't focus their attention. Like there's no surprise. There's no suspense. So when I use these slides, these, these PowerPoint presentation lessons, I found it was such an easy way to engage my, my class. And kind of the fortunate thing is like obviously 2020 rolls around and everybody is working online. Well, because I had years of experience making these presentations, I was pretty well positioned these lessons just instantly transfer into the online classroom. So I, I definitely got a lucky break um, there. So I just want to outline some of the benefits of using slides instead of using like those kind of A4 sheets. Uh, focus. I think this is the most important. You have full control of the information visible on the screen at any one time. Your student is only going to see exactly what you want them to see. And I love eliciting. I love creating suspense. What's I've done it in this presentation, right? You know, I have stuff popping up on the screen. I'm just, I know it's going to be kind of long. I don't want to bore you. I want to keep you engaged. So it's the same thing, right? In your classes, you can do the same with your student. You can direct your students' focus. No more students reading ahead. Engagement is uh, another really cool thing. And I'm actually going to uh, illustrate some examples of this for you on the next couple of slides. But, you know, you can really play around with some dynamic interaction patterns and the third thing is authentic materials right the internet is this amazing endless resource of videos articles blogs you know everything and in an online lesson right now it's just a click away right if i we wanted to watch a video together i could literally just click something and we're there in seconds that is amazing so we can incorporate these authentic these real world materials very easily into the online classroom and all you need everybody has a different setup right i love simple things i use the free zoom account at the start and i use the free powerpoint and that was it right now i'm using okay the paid account because we do these webinars we need more people we need more time but at, at the start you can get all the tools you need completely for free and i want to show you some of the results so i talked about my own program so here's how you can actually present the material in a more engaging way. So let's say we're in an online class, 
right now. Business English, vocabulary. You want to talk about buzzwords. A lot of students aren't going to be too familiar with the term buzzwords, but they might know the concept. So I could have listed some ideas. Have you heard this term before? What do you think it means? Let's check it out. Jonathan, can you read this paragraph for me? I can be annotating. I can be highlighting things. All I need to do is click the mouse to progress to the next slide. And I can illustrate how important it is. There are a lot of buzzwords in the business world, so it's important to get familiar with them. Are you ready? Yes? All right. Awesome. Let's do some practice together. Move into the next slide. All right. Quick matching exercise. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Work alone, and then we're going to compare. Let's see if you can match up the buzzword with the meaning. You can give them permission using Zoom. They can draw on the screen. They can match. They can, they can circle. They can do whatever you want. Uh, you as the teacher have full control over that. Then we can do a little, uh, oh, so I think someone else is drawing there just to, <laughs> to show. Then we uh, can introduce uh, some more controlled practice. Let's complete the sentences. Okay, what do you think? Sue, first sentence. Okay, there are a few important points to discuss here, but I'm a little busy at the moment. Let's later in the week. Which of these buzzwords would make sense in this context? Circle back. You got it. So again, everything is triggered. Super easy, super seamless for you as the teacher. I love gamification. All right, let's gamify it a little bit. All right, Marge, you're at work tomorrow. All right. If someone says this to you, what did I mean? I'll ping you later on. What are they talking about? All right, Marge. Yeah. Okay. Sue, do you agree? Let's move on. All right. What about if uh, they say we'll have to circle back? I want you to perform a deep dive with your team tomorrow. This isn't getting the results we expected. I think we'll need to pivot. Maybe we want to gamify it a little bit more, introduce a time limit. We can trigger an animation going across the screen like this, right? You've got, uh, you've got 60 seconds to write your answers down. They can see this little guy moving across the screen like that as their, uh, as their time um goes so you can really like elevate your lessons you can make it so much more engaging using these uh using these slides of course there's a learning curve there's a bit of playing around but the potential is is there and from talking to teachers from observing very few online teachers are actually using this kind of approach so it's a good way to set yourself ahead to really give your services that premium uh feel um Again, I just, just idioms, introduce the concepts, gamified a little bit more. All right, here's an idiom. In this context, what do you think learn the ropes mean? Uh, listed ideas, trigger the answer. Uh, and I talked about authentic. <laughs> I had this as one of my lessons before Will Smith uh, unfortunately tarnished his reputation at the, uh, it was the Oscars last year, right? Yeah, so part of my course is focused on um, intonation right? And how you can become a more engaging speaker. Because English, we have a very, um, the stress pattern is very important, right? We emphasize the content, where it's the verbs, the nouns, and all the best speakers in the world, they do this very well. So I used Will Smith as a case study, because back then he had a great reputation. Everybody loved Will Smith. So I did a little introduction. We watched the video together. We listened and the students would then uh, identify, you know, at the patterns, what we talked about, then it can be turned into uh, a comprehension. So I'm wary of the time. I just wanted to illustrate some of the possibilities uh, you have with your online classes using these slides, using these presentations. And it's actually really exciting. And like I said, still very few teachers are actually conducting their online lessons in this way. So uh, yeah, it's a great way to stand out and give it that premium feel. Plus, you can incorporate it into your marketing. You know, the best form of proof is demonstration. Show the little clips of your material in action, little clips of your classes, your students engaging. You know, it's going to look fantastic. So uh, just let me know if that makes sense. Let me check in. How are we all doing? Uh, Asma has some, yeah, phonetics here, the British and American English. Awesome. Just going to scroll up the chat. Uh, happened once my students when I was teaching English for business communication. Okay. Cool. Uh, quick time check. 49 minutes. Okay. How is the energy? How are we doing? We all good? Okay. Cool. So just a little check-in. I had three, uh, three goals for this webinar. First, the shift to change to everything, right? Program-based niche teaching. We've done it. Oh, got my animations wrong. <laughs> We've also done, I talked a little bit about creating engaging online lessons using this uh, PowerPoint and Zoom combination now the third thing is positioning yourself to attract high paying students online now i told you i made a lot of mistakes 
right? And I think one of the most valuable things I can share today is like the mistakes I made. So hopefully you won't make the same mistakes and it will save you a lot of time and frustration. So I want to talk a little bit about that first. So I decided I wanted to be a teacher entrepreneur. I wanted to have my online teaching business. What do you think the first thing I did was? What does every online entrepreneur, online teacher need? Let me know in the chat. Let's see who gets it. Don't be shy. No wrong answers. Hmm. Okay. I thought, oh, promote your business. Yeah, promote my business. But the way I decided to promote my business, uh, Asma, was a website. I'm going to make this beautiful website. Now, I knew nothing about website design, not a clue. So, uh, of course, I spent money, right? I paid someone. I paid for a website and I created this beautiful website advertising my lessons. The prices were there. They could click a link. They could book a call. What do you think the problem was with that? Number one, it took a lot of time and I had to spend money. But number two, what's the, what's the problem with having an amazing, fancy website? Uh, you, you guys are so shy. <laughs> you can let me know in the chat if you have any thoughts, any ideas. So imagine you decide you're going to build this beautiful five-star hotel and you build it in the middle of a desert and there's no road for anyone to actually stay in your hotel. So your hotel is there. It's beautiful. Hey, it has everything. It's amazing. It looks great, but nobody knows it's there and nobody has a way to actually find out about it. Nobody has a way to get there. So that, that was my big mistake. It was like this, this amazing hotel in the middle of a desert that no one knew about. So a complete waste of time. Next thing I did was I tried Instagram. So I saw other teachers doing it. I recorded these short videos like, hey, 30 second English tip, you know, and uh, yeah, I, you know, my football team made a little bit of fun of me, you know, starting off and it was quite embarrassing and I did it and like, hey, I got a few likes, I got a few followers, but on Instagram, there seemed to be this expectation, people wanted free stuff. People weren't really in that mindset where they're ready to pay and they certainly weren't ready to pay a premium rate, right? The typical Instagram user just didn't have those expectations. So again, I still have that Instagram today. But um, and in terms of a business tool, it's not very effective for me. So thankfully, you know, I mentioned I, I had a lot of, uh, I was fortunate to work with a lot of amazing people. One of my mentors introduced me to LinkedIn. Now, previously, I thought LinkedIn, it's just, you know, it's like your online CV. Well, there's one really, really cool thing about LinkedIn. This stat is actually as of this year, 2023, it has 875 million users. 1% of those users are posting content, right? As of this year, 2023. Now on Instagram, what percentage of people are sharing content? Like a, a lot, everybody, everybody's an influencer. Everybody's a coach. Everybody's an Instagram. On LinkedIn, it's a tiny, tiny minority. What does this mean? It's an excellent platform for teachers to grow their business. Now, I have no idea how long it would take me on Instagram to get 10,000 followers, but very quickly on LinkedIn, I was able to get a couple of thousand followers because there weren't that many people in the feed doing what I was doing. So it is a wonderful tool to grow your business. The next advantage is you can find and connect directly with your niche. You filters, type in a country, type in an industry. You get a list of people. You can message them directly, introducing yourself. Of course, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that, but you know that would be a topic for... Uh, for another another day and you can convert your new connection so i talked about a website where well, your linkedin profile actually has everything it needs all the potential to be turned into a landing page which means when you connect with these people you trigger that bit of curiosity and they go to your linkedin profile you position yourself as the right person to help and you make it very easy for that person to take action so you can use linkedin to effectively generate students. Now, of course, there, you know, there's a learning curve here and there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. But, you know, after some time, practice, trial and error, of course, I got to a point where, you know, I was consistently connecting with people and pretty frequently every, every week I'd get four or five messages 
looking like this. This person actually reached out to me. I think she saw a piece of content. I'm interested in your English program to help me improve uh, your English. So an interested client. He actually became a client in a, a group class. Hello, Robbie, how are you doing? I'm interested in your English accelerator program. Now, they already knew what I was doing. They knew who I was working with and they knew I had a program and that was all down to my positioning, right? And I'm going to show you guys how to, how to do the same. Could you tell me the price of your program? So instead of me, like, you know, constantly putting out videos and, you know, people are actually coming uh, to me. So you guys ready? We're going to talk a little bit about marketing now. So we're going to do a little pivot. I know the first was kind of teaching. We're going to get into some of the marketing stuff now. You ready? <laughs> Not everybody looks overly enthusiastic at the marketing thing. Look, I, I know it's pretty common. We're teachers, right? At the end of the day, we're teachers. But if we want to succeed independently, this is an important box we need to tick. So I'm going to give you uh, as much actionable advice here as I can. So your LinkedIn profile, this is now your website, right? It has two main purposes. Number one, show your prospects, right? Your niche, when they view your profile, you're the right person to help them, okay? You understand them, you have solutions. And then make it as easy as possible for them to become your clients. And I'm going to show you how to do both of these things today. Let's talk about a mistake. And uh, I'm not calling anybody out here. I just, I see this all the time on LinkedIn, okay? Uh, many, many, many teachers forget who the profile is for, right? Now, if you're an independent teacher, if you want to do freelance, if you want to get your own students, we've got to remember it's for our prospects. It's for our niche, right? We're not trying to get a job. We're not trying to impress, a, you know, a TEFL school or an employer, right? So don't make the mistake. I've seen, that's hundreds. It should be thousands. I've seen thousands of teachers make that. They'll put something like this in their headline. This is English, yes, or, you know, online English teacher. And it's such a wasted opportunity. And then they'll do, they'll talk about their experience, their achievements, what a great professional they are purpose of your profile is to get students, it's not to get a job, right? What do your students care about most, more than anything else? What do they care about? Right. Themselves. They care about themselves, right? So what will mean a lot more to them is demonstrating you understand them. That means way more than, hey, I got this Delta qualification three years ago, or, you know, I did this teaching workshop in whatever, uh, right? Demonstrating you understand them, speaking directly to them, talking about their goals and challenges is the most effective way to position yourself as the right person to help. If you don't show you have a clear understanding of your niche, how are they meant to believe you actually have a solution? How are they meant to believe your program will actually help them? So the understanding needs to come first and we need to clearly communicate that. And remember I talked about like the wrong niche, the tech, Pretty difficult for me to show I understood these tech professionals because I knew absolutely nothing about the industry. So it wasn't very successful. But with the right niche and with a bit more research, I could position myself very quickly as the right person to help these resilience. So I love systems. I love steps. I love trying to make things as easy as possible. So I've developed a six-step LinkedIn profile system specifically for online teachers. Basically, I worked with three or four different coaches for different skills and um, tested it all out, refined it. This is what worked best for me. And this is what has worked best for the teachers that I work with, this system. So everything starts off with your headline, right? This is the first thing people see at the top of your profile. So remember what I said, doesn't create a great first impression. So with the headline, there's a, a formula I can share with you, right? But in a nutshell, what it is, is you mention your niche in the first sentence here, okay? You mention your niche. What are they most interested in themselves, right? You get their attention, right? Italian executives. Then we mention the thing they want to achieve, right? Remember, they're not learning English for fun. They're learning English because it's going to help them achieve something they really care about in their life. And then you mention how you do it. And remember, I showed you those messages from students who were interested. They already knew I had a program. They knew the name of it. So it's, they saw this all communicated clearly right at the top of my profile. Then just a little bit of social proof here. Uh, and again, your LinkedIn profile has a place for testimonials too, and a little call to action here as well. Message me for, for more information. So that would be a much more effective uh, headline formula. So here's something you guys can take with you today. I help niche achieve biggest dream by improving specific skills in specific 
time frame. So I'd strongly recommend using this or something very similar as your first sentence on your LinkedIn profile. Okay. Uh, everything makes sense so far? Great stuff. All right. Asma says, marketing is what makes us grow and expand in the chat. Totally. And like, it was a really important like realization for me. Being a good teacher wasn't enough to succeed independently. We do need to level up in that other skill set, that marketing stuff too. And then they both work in tandem. Um, all right. Next up is the hook. Anyone seen this term before? Anyone familiar with the, the word hook? See some people smiling, nodding. So you might know on your LinkedIn about section. When someone goes to your profile, if they scroll down, you have this about section. Now, all someone is going to see is the first two lines here. There's only one job here, right? Now, remember the mistake I said, 15 years experience, Delta, blah, blah, blah. All they're thinking about is what's in it for me. So we need to trigger their curiosity and do everything we can to get them to click this button here to see more. So here's how you can create a hook. So the only purpose is to get someone to click see more, not just anyone, right? Your niche to click to see more. Here is uh, the most effective to do. Challenge your reader and trigger some curiosity, okay? So here's a formula again. It's not the only way. There are other ways to do it, um, but this is one way you can do it. So you might be wondering why I help niche. You might be wondering why I work with Brazilians. I got asked it a lot. Hey, like, Robbie, you speak Portuguese or, you know? So first, let me see if this resonates. So a little bit of curiosity, and then I bring it back to their favorite subject, themselves and a little emoji just to trigger some curiosity. All right. That's all. My only job, our only job is just to get that see more click. Okay. So just to show you where we are, we've, we've got our headline. We've spoken to our niche. We've mentioned their big dream to show understanding. And then we've triggered some curiosity to hopefully get them to read our about section. Next up, the challenges, right? So remember, how is someone meant to believe you have a solution if you don't show you understand their challenges. So the best way to show your niche, you understand them is by describing their biggest challenges in detail. All right. So we know their pain points, right? We've done our research. We know what our program is going to focus on. So we're just going to put them in bullet. We're not going to write any big blocky paragraphs. I know like, I know like as teachers, we're familiar with that academic style on social media and LinkedIn is still social media. People have different expectations. It's very difficult to keep people's attention. So we're going to use short, punchy sentences and some line spacing, some white space, just to make it easy to get them from one sentence to the next sentence. So here's an example. These are pretty much the pain points I used in my own program that I showed you. And you, I use you language. I speak directly to the niche. You can't think of the right words and lose confidence when you have to speak English in meetings, calls, and presentations. You find it difficult to understand English-speaking clients. Hey, they were in Dublin. A lot of difficult accents here, right? You speak quickly and have different accents. You're frustrated by your lack of progress and real-life authentic results after taking general English courses and using language apps. This was a really good thing to mention because in marketing, it's very powerful when you can position yourself as a better alternative. Now, I had inside knowledge of the frustration some students experienced in these schools, in these general English courses with different levels, different needs. They have to learn stuff that isn't really relevant to them. So it showed a good level of understanding that I could mention this here in my uh, profile. So do be specific. Don't use complex language, jargon, and chunky paragraphs, right? Remember who you're writing to. You're not writing to teachers. You're not writing to schools. You're writing to your niche, simple language. Okay. We're not trying to impress anybody. Um, all right. We're flying here. Next up, the consequence. So uh, I talked about marketing. This is kind of a little marketing thing that is really, really important. I put this chair here because there's an analogy I can share with you. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit severe, but if it helps you remember, it's worth it. So would you guys like me to share the chair analogy with you? Just give me a yes, if you would, or a no, if you, if you'd rather not. Okay. That's what says ready. Yes. Okay, thumbs up. We've got a yes there. All right. Awesome. So the chair analogy. Now imagine you are in a room and there are two chairs. Your friend is sitting in one chair and the other chair is empty. Your job is to get your friend to take action, to stand up and sit in the other chair. How are we going to do this? Well, we could say, look at this chair. It's so comfortable. Oh, look, you know, it has leather. It's a recliner. It can move up and down. It has everything you need. It's beautiful. Oh, you're not going to believe how comfortable it is. It might work. But there's also a way, way, way more effective way of getting them to stand up and take action. And you know what it is? 
see someone nodding. I think maybe. <laughs> yeah, Inga. Well, you could say something about the chair they're sitting in. You well, yeah, you could say something about it, or you could just set it on fire, and then they kind of have to get up, don't they? Right? Because there's a consequence if they if they don't get up. Now, just to be clear, and this is being recorded, I do not advocate setting any chairs on fire or causing any harm to anyone at any time for any reason, right? But the point is people, human beings, we are more motivated to move away from a painful situation, a situation that is hurting us than we are to move towards a pleasurable situation. That's the number one driver of behavior. It's actually moving away from something that's hurting us. And a lot of people stay in their comfort zone, even though they're unhappy, because they can't clearly see how it's damaging them. So once we've listed the pain points, we're going to do one sentence just to highlight the consequence of your niche not actually taking action to improve their situation. So again, many people won't leave their comfort zone unless they can clearly see how it is harming them. And we're not doing this to manipulate anyone. We're coming from a place of wanting to help. If you truly believe you can help someone, you owe it to them to show them, hey, look, you know, it's important to do this because this is what could happen if you don't. Uh, in terms of a formula to do this, after you list your prospects three biggest pain points, write one sentence describing what will happen if they don't do something to fix them. So an example would be, you know, if things don't change, you'll continue to be overlooked for promotions and miss out on big career opportunities. And hey, that's probably one of the reasons they checked out your profile anyway. So it does show that in-depth understanding. Now, just give me a thumbs up if this concept uh, makes sense. Cool. So in marketing, it's a really, really important thing uh, to, to know, like you, you got to understand your niche. You, you got to do your research. So you know what makes them, um, tick. So the whole point of your profile is to get action. So mention the biggest consequence of them not taking action. We are flying. All right. Next up, right. We show we understand them now. And only now we mention the solution, right? We never put it in their face straight away. We got to build that trust. Show we understand them first. So, uh, like I said earlier, the most attractive solutions are quick and easy. Right. So when describing your program, you want to emphasize these qualities. Again, here's a copy and paste formula you can use. My adjective plus program name. Right. So in my case, it was the English Accelerator program. It's a result of over, for me, I think it was eight or nine years' experience working with resilience. Uh, so again, shows hey. And then they can see, okay, well, it makes sense that this would be focused because it's designed with a thorough understanding of the challenges you face when communicating in English and it's focused on delivering results quickly. So I used all my experience, all my knowledge to put it into this focused program because I understand you and to help you get results quickly. Uh, does that make sense? Cool, right? Now, whenever you talk about speed and ease, you're gonna encounter a lot of skepticism. And to be honest, rightfully so. Like there are a lot of people out there selling things uh, a lot of scams and and they know this principle too. Like they know speed and ease, right? So for that reason, people are going to be skeptical whenever you promise them an easier or quicker way to do something, right? Even though you have a quicker and easy way for them, we need to address their skepticism, not ignore it. So here is the best way to do it, right? There are other ways for sure to address skepticism, but the easiest, most effective way is testimonials. So here's a copy and paste formula. For testimonials we're gonna acknowledge hey look i get it sounds too good to be true well here's what some of my clients had to say and you can just put in some quotes from testimonials your clients have shared with you on linkedin there's even a testimonial section in your profile so what i recommend doing especially if you're just starting out is reaching out to former students if they're on linkedin even better and just asking them if they could share a little testimonial about their experience uh, working with you. And hey, let's say you're right. We'll go back to that example. You're working with Italian executives, but you helped a Korean improve his English, right? If the thing you helped that past student with is still relevant to your new niche, the testimonial is still valid. So maybe you help that Korean person feel more confident speaking English. If that's something your niche care about, it is still a valid testimonial. Your testimonials don't only have to be from your niche. It can be from another group if you help them with a challenge that is still relevant to your niche. Make sense? Fantastic. All right, awesome. You guys are doing so, so amazing. How's the energy? Let me check. Let me check in with everyone now. We good? Almost everybody is still with us, which is absolutely amazing, right? So we're almost there. Um, if you uh, have no testimonies, I just wanted to talk 
a little bit uh, about this. If you have no testimonials yet, do not worry. They will come. But at the beginning of business, especially if you're a new, new to teaching as well, relatively new to teaching, there's no harm in just offering a little bit of free value up front. And people take it, they appreciate it, and asking them, hey, like, if you found this truly helpful and you believe it would help other people, it would be amazing if you could just share a little testimonial for me. Okay, so I know, like, we don't want to do anything for free, right? But it is, it is a, a, another effective way to get testimonials if you if you don't have them. Uh, finally, call to action, right? So all of this boils down to is getting action, getting the people who click your profile to take action. Now, I see a lot of mistakes with calls to action, so I want to give you uh, some key principles here when you ask for action. The best calls to action are low friction. So, for example, we're not going to use language like "buy my English course for one thousand dollars today," right? We're not going to use that type of language. It's high friction. It can build a wall. It can build an obstacle. And another mistake people make in their calls to action is they have multiple different things you can do. Hey, like you can book a call up here, or you can send me a message here, or you can check this thing out over there. Well, the more options you give someone, the less likely they are to take any option, right? So just in terms of visualizing it, you don't want your call to action to look like this. You want it to look like this, a straight line as easy as possible to act upon. So uh, bonus tip, you can increase the likelihood of someone taking action if you tell them what's going to happen next. So let's say your call to action is message me, send me a message, and I'll be happy uh, to give you all the information, right? So instead of just send me a message, you're going to add that little bit after and tell them what happens after they send the message. So you remove the mystery and uncertainty. Send me a message and I'll be happy to answer your questions and give you all the info. Now they know what's going to happen after they take action. You've removed the mystery. Therefore, the probability of them taking action increases. Uh, bonus tip two, give them a keyword to make it even easier for them to message you, right? These are non-native speakers, right? If, they, if you say, send me a message, they have to think about what to say. What if they make an English mistake? What if you judge them? What if you think they're not good enough? Record, just give them a keyword. Right now, I'm looking uh, for a few more niche Italian executives to work closely with who want to unlock more career opportunities. If you're interested, message me the word English and I'll send you all the info, right? One action, no mystery keyword, okay? So I highly, highly recommend you only take one marketing thing away from this whole presentation. This will probably be the most useful thing, how you ask for action, okay? So if this makes sense, give me a thumbs up if you're still with me. Good. We've got 95% battery so far. So good. Awesome. Uh, great. Someone says 99% of people on other social media sites are sharing action. And that's the cool thing that LinkedIn is just 1%. Great stuff. All right. So you have done absolutely amazing. All of you, 35 still here. I think we started with 36. So that is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to take some time to answer questions or clear up any any doubts if you if you if you have them but i also want to talk if it's okay talk a little bit about how i can be more helpful if you want to take things uh a little further so is it cool if i tell you guys a little bit about that great stuff all right awesome so whenever i i do these things i always ask myself uh this question because i think like all business boils down to right how can i be more helpful to the group i work with and the answer I have is take what I've learned, tested and refined and just remove the guesswork and frustration for other people to make it quicker, easy to follow and as affordable for other teachers to you know, get the, the same results. So uh, for everyone uh, who has registered for this masterclass, I'll put two things together and really the two biggest things we've talked about, the two big pillars of success are number one, having that program that can solve problems and surpass your student's expectation. And number two, positioning yourself correctly on social media to attract those high paying students. So what uh, I've put together is, like I, I showed you some of my material earlier, right? Uh, my curriculum, I've made a version of that available for other teachers, for other freelance teachers to use with their own clients, with their own students. In terms of the modules, it covers all the main ones we talked about answering job interview questions, uh, delivering presentations, writing professional emails, expanding vocabulary, buzzwords, all the idioms, all the, all the stuff we looked at. So it's also fully customizable. So even if you have some niche specific areas you want to touch on, you can easily edit it, tweak, make changes to your, to your heart's content. So 
one of the reasons I actually started working with James, who was one of my mentors originally was this was one of the biggest pain points I saw other teachers have. It took me about six months to build the program and another six months to refine it. And it's very stressful, you know, actually designing a curriculum. So um, yeah, putting this together for other teachers, I found it was, you know, it could, it could remove a lot of the frustration, a lot of the uh, stress from that. Uh, I've also have teaching methodology guides like and tutorials going through how to use the material, how to teach it with your students, the technical aspects, all that kind of stuff. And also I have a LinkedIn accelerator course uh, so you can position yourself on LinkedIn to attract high paying students and take advantage of the awesome platform it is. Uh, now it includes a ton of templates, a step-by-step -step process, basically to take all of the guesswork away. So you guys will know exactly what to say on your profile and, you know, nail each section down. So it's as effective as possible. So, uh, how to receive it. I have a link here now, individually, my curriculum, it's usually 250 euro uh including the guides and the linkedin accelerator course is 200 euro but because this is a webinar it's a special occasion and all of you have been so great to join me here today uh i have it available for 147 euro and that includes everything so all of this for that for that price so if you're interested you can get all the information i'll just copy the link and i'll put it in the chat you can get all the information here um so feel free to take a look at that now or just save it somewhere to check out later or maybe you know i know i've worked with uh, some of you before maybe you have maybe you have the curriculum and not the linkedin course maybe you have the linkedin course not the curriculum and you're interested in just getting one uh message me feel free to send me a message on linkedin or facebook and i'll, I'll be able to work something out uh for you but yeah if you want everything it's available at that uh that special price of 147 it would usually cost 450 in total um so uh brings us here to the to the questions right so uh yeah we still got a great number of people here um if anyone has a question either like stick your hand up and i'll see you in the chat or just uh like type it into the uh chat hi robbie yeah, uh, i think jonathan was first and then laura okay. hey jonathan Hi, Robbie. No, I think that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the tips and encouraging us all to think about things. Uh, my question is not specifically about your course, but uh, you are moving your head and moving around. It'd be wonderful if you were able to show us what your technical setup is as well. Do you have oh. two screens? What are you doing? How do you, how do you operate? How do you do all super, of that? Super, super, super simple. So right now uh, I'm back in Ireland. Uh, I was in Mexico. And uh, I've converted my sister's old bedroom into an office while I'm going to be here for the next uh, for the next few weeks. So literally all I have, I have a microphone here, I have my laptop and I have a desk chair and and that's that's it. That's and that's 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 all that's needed. You know, it takes it takes every box. Um, now, it's not as kind of luxurious as the fancy apartment in Mexico a few weeks ago, but hey, like I have everything I need. So I'm. You know, I'm happy. I'm happy here. But uh, yeah, the cool thing is you, you don't have to spend a ton of money. The microphone costs uh, about 100 euro. It's called a Blue Yeti Nano. And I do recommend getting a microphone because like laptops, mo even good laptops tend to have poor quality audio. And, you know, we talked about giving your lessons, your classes, that premium feel. I think audio goes a long way to, uh, to doing that. So I'll type the name of uh, the microphone into the chat here. Uh, Blue Yeti. No, no. And when I bought it about three, four years ago, it was about a hundred euro on Amazon. So hopefully it's, it's cheaper uh, today. That answered the question? Yes. Thanks very much. No worries. No, it's, it's an Irish accent I detect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just from a wee bit north of you, but yes. Great stuff. Great stuff. All right. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, Laura. Hey. Hi. Hi, Robbie. Great to speak with you and see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, so how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. And you're doing very well, obviously. Thank you for this uh, presentation. So my question is, is this an updated version of the original curriculum? I remember I was one of your first customers. So is this a, a, a new, new and improved or? 
It so, seems so. It seems so. Mm-hmm. First of all, thank you so much for mm-hmm. being one of the first customers. That's amazing. So if you were mm-hmm. one of the first customers, I would have emailed you with the most up-to-date version. Okay. So I, I did update it at the end of 2021, start of 2022. And I sent that update out to everyone who bought it for free. So okay. I think you're going to be fully up to date, but if not, just send me a message after and I'll, I'll give you the link to the most up to date version. But everyone who bought it, I have a list and they were all sent the most up to date version. So the Thank one you. here, most up to date version. Oh, so the, this is good. Thank you so much. And then the other, the other question is, um, the, the problem is that the niche sometimes is too big. I think, mm. you know, it's too broad because I'm doing everything that you've said. And there were some personal things that had gone on in my life. So I had to leave the business for about four months, but I've been really consistent from January up until now. And I think that sometimes the problem is that we're too broad, you know, mm-hmm. in our, so for example, um, my niche is um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, just saying that is, is exhausting, <laughs> mm-hmm. but but I'm into that group of folks because it involves all the work that I did prior to becoming a teacher, right? Mm-hmm. So I get lots of likes, but not very many customers. Got it. So it sounds yeah. like you're mm-hmm. taking that passion box, right? You're passionate about helping them. And you also have the experience and knowledge box, which is really good. So the thing to focus on then is remember that viable business mm-hmm. box. So do they have a need? For the service you're providing we really need to identify that right first. What exactly is the service and does it fix um pertinent problem further right. and once we know that then we just need to figure out okay well do do they have the money to pay you what you deserve so i would say a little bit more research there you've got the connections they're engaging let's find out exactly what their problems are and then you just mm-hmm. need to position yourself say hey look i understand you have these problems i have this thing that solves them right right Thank you, Robbie. Okay, no, great, great, great question. So it's like kind of exactly what I've, I've done here. I know from talking to teachers, two of the biggest problems are actually creating a program because it's time consuming and then positioning themselves online. So these things are designed to tackle both of those problems. So yeah, just uncover exactly what they are and then your solution is there to, to fix, fix them. Uh, great, so Sandy, um, I think I see a uh, hand up there, hey. Hi, Robbie. Uh, sorry about the no video. I've, no internet's not great. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's extremely motivating. It's been absolutely great. I've made lots of notes, so thank you. Um, and just a very quick question from me, really, just to ask. During, I wanted to know what your niche was, and I'm interested now. You've you've mentioned that. Um, yeah. How many students do you have in a class at a time? Or roughly? Great, great question. So I'll start off with the niche and then I'll tell you uh, about the uh, students in, in the online class. So my niche, like I said, I started in tech, it evolved. And then eventually I focused on resilience and particularly yeah. resilience who wanted to work in manage, management or leadership roles who are based in English speaking countries. And like I said, LinkedIn is this amazing tool. You can very quickly find them and connect with them. So I primarily worked with Brazilians based here in Ireland in the UK, in the States, and in Canada, and particularly Brazilians in those more senior positions. So that was my niche. Uh, Originally, it was a one-on-one program. The price uh, was 600 euro for a 10-week program. The 10-week program consisted of one lesson a week, which was 60 to 70 minutes in duration, some tasks to complete between uh, sessions, and it covered all those modules uh, I've shown you today now fortunately i started to get some traction i got some more testimonials i learned like i said marketing was a big gap for me i learned about marketing and positioned myself on linkedin the right way and i got to a point where i was getting enough interest where i could then start to work with people in groups and of course groups is a much more efficient way to work because hey our time investment stays pretty much the same right T- typically the group class it might take 10 minutes longer because i do a q a at the end, kind of like like this. I didn't want anyone to go away with like a burning question that they hadn't answered. So I'd add a few minutes on for that, but everything else stayed the same. The program stayed the same. And I worked with three in a group. One of my groups had four, all the other groups had uh, three. Sometimes I'd work with just two. And the reason I found that was such a sweet number is it allows you to kind of play around with those interaction 
patterns or I, Laura, great answer. I want you to choose a question now and ask Jonathan, you know, like, so you can, you, as a teacher, yeah. you can take a step back and facilitate the interaction. Again, with the slides, it becomes very easy uh, to do that. And then the price when I launched my group program, it was a 10 week program. I then bumped it down to uh, an eight week program because I could make the material more focused when I realized, okay, they don't really need that. It's easier if I take this out and streamline that. So it eventually became an eight week program and it was uh, 600 um, for the uh, eight week program uh, if it was a group, right? So, you know, the hourly rate then it was a really, really nice return uh, per hour. And the cool thing then was I'd already done pretty much the program. So there was very little lesson planning time uh, involved. Right. Great. Um, just one more question from me then. Did you have sure. a couple of programs running at the same time? It was, or do you have? It was always, or... it was always the same. It was always the same uh, program. Right. So yeah. It, yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Now yeah. I, I had, sometimes I had extra modules, right? So I had email writing, but if this group really wanted to focus on job interviews, I would say, okay, we'll do an extra session on job interviews and I'll remove the email writing part so I was flexible I always made sure the program fit the needs of the, the students um but it was always like one program kind of like like imagine you have a menu uh with five or six items and you just need to choose the three items that best fit the student if, if that makes sense yeah. Like yeah yeah got it thank you so much it's um really motivating i've been threatening to do it for years i'm currently in southeast asia as a secondary english teacher but i intend to go home next year and set myself up online so you've been really helpful so happy Thanks to hear that it's it's a it's a crazy journey but like it's been the most rewarding thing uh I've, I've ever done so like wishing you every every success uh with it i'll be looking into some of your materials as, as well which will really help the marketing side is is my big issue so yeah i'll be definitely looking at some of those to to uh purchase from you thanks a lot great stuff you're not alone there by the way with the marketing stuff for sure um all right thanks sandy cheers um let me just jump into the into the uh chat uh okay anyone else have a question anything about anything we covered today or any of the materials everyone here is is so polite just listening <laughs> don't be shy anyone ravi i had a question for you I, hey, it's barry right barry yeah 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 how are you how are you Your good, thing says good, good to see you yeah you too man um, I, I, I have ADHD, obviously, um, at least I was diagnosed that when I was a child before they had the diagnosis of it. Um, I, I, um, I, I like to do more than one niche. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I create separate identities, separate branding, separate names, Nobody would know that I do more than one niche any more than they know that I have ADHD, which actually I don't have so much anymore. I outgrew it. But um, what's your opinion? And I've noticed that James has actually has about four niches now. He's actually, uh, James has turned away from specifically saying teaching entrepreneurs or teaching teachers how to be entrepreneurs to using the word coach and three other words so mm -hmm. even using his as him as an example uh could you address this please about having more than one niche for those of us who have high energy and multi multi talents and interests for sure it's it's such a such a good question and i know the temptation is always there like to you know, some, some days we'll wake up and we'll feel a different energy for something and the temptation is there to go into it. I think from a purely business perspective, we've got to master, we've got to nail down the first thing before we move on to a new thing. Otherwise, we're never going to complete the process with anything, right? So for, for example, I'm no longer teaching. I do miss it a lot, but I committed myself fully to working with teachers at the beginning of 2022 and I put my, immersed myself fully in that because I know how challenging it would be if I was my energy was divided across two different niches with different needs and different um different interests so one thing you could do that I think might like uh satisfy that kind of like need that like desire and and to use that energy is with your niche 
like you want to be specific, you want to nail down, but with your sources of income, you can diversify, right? So that means within that niche, you can offer different products, right? You become an expert in helping that group of people, but you don't just have one solution. So when I started working with teachers, you know, primarily I would do one-on-one coaching, right? Now I've created different products, different solutions to diversify my sources of income. So that for me, that satisfies my energy to be creating new things. I'm still working with teachers. That's what I specialize with. And you mentioned James and James, I think like his main focus now is on that kind of newer niche you mentioned, because he knows if like you spread yourself too thin, you know, across too wide a space, you just become less effective in, in every area. So just to summarize with your niche nail down, but with your source of income, you can diversify, meaning different products, different solutions. So does that make sense? Okay, kind of. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'll be specific. Like I have, um, uh, I have a program called English IQ because it's proven scientifically that bilingualism uh, increases intelligence, increases academics, and so I, I've, and I just looked up on ChatGPT: is bilingualism a niche? And it does. Now they say it is. I, whether it is or not, I don't know. But um, I teach mainly in the China market um, and a few Brazilians because I'm here in Brazil. But, um, but but I also have something that I've created called um, English EQ, which is about teaching using uh, emotional intelligence and teaching English with books and materials related to English, but for emotional intelligence so i'm doing iq and eq okay. um, that's an example of of my diversity uh, and and i actually with my with my english iq class some of my students go into a program called speaks right where i have children chinese chinese children as young as seven years old where i'm teaching them how to write storybooks in english and then we're publishing them on Amazon.com in 170 countries. So I've kind of got a mixed bag of, of things that I'm doing, all related to English teaching and learning. Uh, you're a busy, you're a busy man. Like, so I'm glad you have a lot of energy because that would be very time and energy uh, consuming. Now, I, I confess, I don't know much about those niches. So I'm not in a position, I don't want to tell you anything that's incorrect, but just the advice I mentioned before, I think it, it it still applies. Like I, I would here, I would narrow that down. Uh if if I were I, here but here's the thing, and I would be anybody else, I'm gonna try to talk to Jonathan. He's here in, in Brazil as well. Um I uh maybe we can even network, but the thing is, Robbie, is that I I started in the late seventies, early 1980 was the first time I was teaching fifth grade students how to write a newspaper. And I got a, you know, I, so, I mean, I have been doing this for over 40 years where I've been doing either business startups or education. That's all I've done my whole life is education in all levels, including up to university administration. I've done every level of education and, and a lot of writing public, TV and radio interviews, uh, everything in communication. And so I have a whole bunch of experience. These are not new things to me to try to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like it's a new experience for me to do any of these things that I'm doing. I'm not, it, it, it's not that hard for me to be doing, but so I do, I'm having a harder time relating to, I, I want to, I'm really wanting to listen to your advice even though you're really young, I, I think probably, but um, the well, thing not is, so much. <laughs> well, you're still, you, yeah, but anyway, <laughs> but no, no, but to anybody in the group, I, I would welcome uh, suggestions because niche has been, I, I totally understand with what, what you're saying about if you are going too many directions, you, you don't stay focused and you know, yeah. you, it's, it, it's, it can be a mess. Um, the, the thing is, is that I've always, I could have worked in a circus if I, you know, because I can juggle so many balls at the same time. 
And the thing is, is that, I mean, when we had fax machines and computers and I'd have two phone, one phone at each ear, this is how insane I am with doing multi things. We, you can only focus on one thing at a time, but I, I'm this huge multitasker and I would get terribly bored if I wasn't doing these different things. So I, I want to agree with you, but I also, I don't totally get it. And maybe somebody can help me. Let, let me tell you two things. And I think like, it's probably something we, we can talk more at, uh, at more length uh, in, in future. Two things. If you think like just having one business on one niche isn't going to be time and energy consuming, trust me, it is. Like there's not a sec. And, and to be honest, I love what I'm doing, which makes it worthwhile. But there's not a minute and a second of the day where I'm not thinking about the business, where I'm not writing down an idea, where I'm not replying to a message. So even if you do only have one niche, you're still going to have your hands full, like if you immerse, if you throw yourself into this. And it's it's a good thing. Like I said, it's the most rewarding thing I did. Uh, but let's let's chat more about that uh, at length. I see two people here with their hands up. I think Dennis, uh, you had the hand up first and then uh, Jelena uh, as well. So uh, Dennis, hey. Yeah. Hi, hi, hi uh, Robbie. Thank hey, you for, it's, it's great uh, to see you. Yeah, yeah, it's a pleasure, yes. Um, I, I really learned a lot from your uh, your talk and uh, from why I, what I got is that uh, the program is a course, right? And the teacher should be a course creator. That's what I got. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the 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 price. It's uh, it's a it's an affordable price. I mean the the package that you offered us. Sure. And I, I've, I've been looking for a business English course that I can you know that I can use for my classes or I mean for my future class. My concern right now is uh, actually two things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not actually uh, trained as an as an ESL curriculum designer, so I I don't have much of a you know the the, the skills for course design. So how do you uh, how do you approach that? I, I mean I'm not that confident if I would be designing my course. I, I might I might have the idea, but you know. Um, Curriculum design is, you know, um, such a huge thing. <laughs> All right, sure. and that's one question. Another question uh, is, how do you choose the nationality that you want to work with? Um, how do I, that's also um, something that I am challenged with right now. Because, you right. know, the world's a big stage. I mean, <laughs> it's huge, right? So it's niching down to a specific um, nationality, maybe, or learners. So how do you approach that? Um, choosing wow. the nationality or your learners and curriculum design, those who are challenged with it. Thank brilliant, you. brilliant questions. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dennis. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad uh, you got some takeaways from today. So let's start with the curriculum design. Okay, so even if you don't have, you know, course design experience, I guess most most teachers probably probably don't, right? Especially working in schools, you know, there's a way, a way of doing things. It's usually a textbook. Um, the most important thing, is get really clear on the challenges your program is going to solve. And I think three is a nice number. If it's four, it's okay too. And then think, okay, how much time am I going to allocate to each of these challenges, right? So will it be three lessons, four lessons? And then you can divide it up into the modules, right? So we've got to start there. Before we even start creating the lessons, we have to have that map in our mind so we know whereabouts we are on the map. And also, so we have something we can market, something we can promote, you know, something we can build our business so we start there and then from there then it's, it's just a lesson by lesson approach it's one lesson at a time so you know when when you start let's say you get your first student for your program the only thing that matters is their next lesson hey you've got a map you know what's going to come later but it's just going to be one lesson at a time mm -hmm. right? the next lesson is going to be lesson two i'm not going to worry about three four and five yeah and i'm going to nail down lesson two and the cool thing is by the time you finish the program with that one student you pretty much got the full thing made all right it's going to be refined it's going to be improved but you know you've got something you can you can work with and like i had course design experience like i i had i had completed a, a delta and there's a, delta. You know, a module there about course design yeah. it was helpful sure. but honestly you know you, you can it, it's time consuming it, it's a challenge but you can do it without mm -hmm. Without it, if you just nail down the challenges and you work on that lesson by lesson basis, you can you can do it. And uh, yeah, key advice would be like less is more, 
sometimes just give them what they need right and that's more All valuable right. than giving them a, a ton of stuff okay and uh yeah it, like if you think if uh if you think having the the done for you curriculum will save you a headache man feel free to yeah. message i'm happy to give you more info about that uh too uh the second question was how to, to choose, choose the, the national yes Great question. So with the nationality, again, the things to think about, like, are you passionate working with these people? Do they have a need to pay for your service? And do they, uh, sorry, do they have a need uh, to improve for, their English, you know, or to do yes. the course you're providing? And then do they have the financial means? Mm-hmm. So like I said, like Brazilians that had the need, I was passionate about helping them. But when I built my business around working with Brazilians in Brazil, that third box was difficult to take you know they, they didn't really have the financial means to pay me yes. what i'd like to earn just because of the currency exchange so i made that shift and then mm-hmm. it was brazilians in you know ireland or english-speaking countries and actually that increased the need because they're experiencing like challenges every day in english you know they actually had to live that situation so the need was higher but they also had the financial means too because you know they were earning in the same uh currency so like if you're thinking about a nationality there'd be some things to think about like spanish speakers in Latin America or Spanish speakers in Spain, for example, like, so, you know, again, just go back to those three boxes. Yeah. And um, keep those three boxes as your, as your framework. Um, Okay. Takes a lot of research then. (laughs) Right. So that's what it's all about, man. Everything starts with research, right? No action without research. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, you. Great. So we've got uh, Jelena and then Paul. So, uh, Hey, Uh, first of all, your name, am I pronouncing that correctly? No, of course you're not, uh, but never mind. It's Yelena. Oh, actually. tell me, tell me. All right, Yelena. Um, actually, yeah. I'm, a, of course, an EFL teacher um, here in Serbia, and um, no, there is a great need um, uh, for a number of students, uh, consider a number of students would like to pass uh, a Cambridge exams. Um, and I would like uh, to know how can I create lessons for a Cambridge exam without messing with copyright? <laughs> Ah, okay, good. Well, so, so the Cambridge would that be the CAE exam? No, actually, uh, first certificate first. Ah, English. first certificate. Okay, so so that's around like B one, B two level, if I remember. B two, right? B2. Got it. Okay, so again, it's it goes back to identifying the biggest challenges, right? That's that's being that niche teacher. So, for example, you could become a Cambridge coach for the speaking. Mm-hmm part of the exam uh-huh. right because you know the way they get a score I, I know IELTS works like this I'm not as familiar with Cambridge but I believe they got a score for each section right each part of the exam like there's the use of English uh uh-huh. the, the speaking the, and there's the listening so you could become a specialist in helping them with these certain areas so if it's the speaking you don't even need to worry about um you don't even need to worry about copyright there because you know you know the questions you know how the speaking exam is conducted so you just give them actionable tips for answering the questions and role play it together uh with the use of english i believe there are lots of free exercises online uh, i believe that's where you use the gap fills like different prepositions mm-hmm. and linking right. words and stuff you could even just take an actual exam you know you can get access to the past papers and just create your own like you know uh and, and make sure it matches the difficulty uh level as well to avoid uh copyright um and then with the listening i guess that's more of a challenge so it might be a case of just purchasing the listening material that gives you permission to then use it with your own students because i believe you purchased the book it the copyright gives you the right to use it with your own private students just not to resell it so again right, right there so, so I think if okay. i'd like I, to create a program i i can't use uh any of these obviously well i mean like for example the speaking I mean, that part of your program is going to be preparing uh-huh. people for the speaking Cambridge exam. So, uh-huh. you know, you, you share tips, you role play the speaking part of the uh, of the exam. For the use of English, you know, you incorporate the actual past exam paper exercises as part of your program. I don't believe that would be a breach of, uh, of, of copyright. Uh, Robbie, with, yeah. Excuse me, just a second, because I wanted to let her know. Uh, it, it seems like she could use something like the off to class platform. Uh, it does have the CEFR test, which Cambridge is, it's an Oxford test. Also, Cambridge uses it, the CEFR, the levels A1 to C2. Uh, it has all the materials. It has every 
aspect of English learning and you don't have to worry about copyright things. It has lessons, it has homework, it has everything. And it's not very expensive. It's called off, O-F-F, and then the number two, class.com. I've huh. used it and it would, I think it might work for what you're talking about, ma'am. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Sorry. For sure. So, uh, yeah, and, and I don't think you'll need to worry about copyright if you, you take existing resources and incorporate them uh -huh. into your own um, your own program. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, both. Cool. No problem. No problem. Um, I, I think Paul and then uh, Ahmed. Paul. Hey, thanks, Robbie. Hey, um, hey. I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, firstly, I'm a bit uh, curious about the niche you were teaching. So you mentioned it was sure. Brazilian. Um, uh, it was Brazilians who'd relocated to Ireland. Did you focus in on a particular um, business English niche there, or was it just any any Brazilian that that was in Ireland? I know. No, the second. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. And and the second, the second, yeah, it's, it's quite quick. And the second thing, um, uh, if if you don't mind, I'd like to get into the uh, perhaps slightly um, grubby topic of uh, of of money. Um, sure. Uh, as, as much as you're willing willing to share, I mean, you mentioned uh, when you were teaching your niche how much you were uh, pulling in a month, but um, I'm curious to know how many teaching hours you were doing uh, a week, and um, did you, when you started, did you go in at a lower price and edge it up? I'm kind of uh, quite curious to know what your journey is there, uh, as much sure. as you're willing to share, short of uh, oh, showing of us course. your bank statements, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. I think I actually did a post on LinkedIn where I did actually... Uh, Sure, but no, they're really, really good questions asked. And I think it is really important to be transparent uh, about about these these topics. Um, so the first question I believe was about the niche. So it was uh, it was with Brazilians, but a focus on business English. Uh, so again, like I had topics like preparing for job interviews where there was nothing too Brazilian specific, but then I also had a pronunciation section where one of my lessons was avoiding the most common pronunciation mistakes Brazilians make when they speak English. So that's where I could really, you know, that's where research really benefited me. And I could really position myself as a specialist because I knew, hey, like Portuguese speakers in Brazil, you know, sometimes that R sound can be a challenge in English, right? Because in Portuguese, it's kind of like a H at the start of a word, the M and the N. So I had this sec section where I'd go through all the most common pronunciation mistakes go through the mouth movements with the student and hey here's how to avoid it here are the misunderstandings this can cause and that was kind of like the the language specific section of the course and of course pronunciation is really important because in business in communication most misunderstandings are because of pronunciation not necessarily bad grammar so that was a really important pillar of my program uh too so yeah the business english but with the niche specific aspects sprinkled sprinkle through it um the next question was the next question about money or was there another question uh before before that no i think i think that was it just the uh, the, uh what niche you did and uh yeah just more more, more info on uh on, on what you're able to charge and, and how many hours you taught and yeah, I'm quite great. curious. great so when i started uh i started at this price of 60 euro an hour or 600 for my my 10 week program Right. So that was probably 600 for my 10 week program. And I gave students the option they could pay up front or they could pay in an installment option. Now, of course, the installments would be, you know, uh, slightly more expensive. Now, miraculously, within a week, I got my first student at that price. And I thought, oh, wow, like this is going to be easy. I had that false early optimism, you know, within my first um I am really like I, I spent a while learning, trying to figure everything out. But once I really got that plan together and became a program based niche teacher, once I settled on that, it, it didn't take long to get the first student at that price. And then, you know, my false optimism evaporated pretty quickly because I was able to set up a few more calls with these students, but I just couldn't get it at that price point. And there were two reasons. Number one was, uh, you know, I, I just didn't have my skill. There was a skill gap. Right. You need to have certain skills to be able to communicate the value on a call. I didn't have experience with that. So I wasn't doing a good enough job communicating what I had to offer. Also, my program wasn't really created at that point. So it was more difficult. Uh, but also uh, my niche was Brazilians, but I was focusing on Brazilians based in Brazil because I thought, OK, well, that's where most Brazilians are. And of course, that price point for them was a challenge, right, because of the currency 
exchange. So I made a few pivots, right? Again, like they say, the definition of insanity is keep doing something, keep doing the same thing if it's not working. So I identified what was wrong. I made the pivot. I swapped to focus more on Ireland and Western countries, connecting with Brazilians there using LinkedIn. I learned a bit more about sales and, you know, communication. And I actually brought my price down down to 50 euro an hour or 500 euro, started making sales, three, four, three sales, four sales, and then said, okay, my program is taking shape. I'm more confident. The feedback is really good. I'm going to increase the price, brought it back up to 60. And from there, I was able to bring it up to a hundred uh, euro an hour. I got to a point then when I was working with about 20 students. And I know like we're working in a school, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it, at the time it felt like it, it felt like a lot. And that's when I decided there was still interest coming in now because, you know, I'd built up that bit of traction on LinkedIn. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to pivot into groups. So I got my hours down to uh, about 11 teaching hours uh, a week. So it was four groups and still a handful of one-on-one -on -one students. So even with those lower hours, booking in those groups, uh, that's when my income kind of hit that, that 5,000, just over 5,000 euro threshold. So at that point, it was around 11 teaching hours a week and it was a combination of groups and individual students. Now with the groups, there was a bit of maintenance involved too, because you know it was my first time doing it. So that took a little bit of time but uh in terms of pure teaching hours it, it was at around 11 uh, at that point so hopefully i've answered everything there absolutely yeah that's great thanks great stuff man all right thanks for that paul i know it's good man never be afraid to ask about the money stuff because look it's important you know we're all we're all here to earn a good living at the end yeah of the i day. think uh, efl teachers um we're, we're kind of conditioned to blush when the topic of money comes up i think i know i know but yeah. uh it's it's important yeah, so i'm glad i'm glad you asked that thank you for, for that uh amit hey uh, i think you're you're still on mute yeah excuse me for uh not sitting up straight no worries man as long as you're comfortable it's the, it's the most important how are you uh good uh you definitely caught on to a few of what you said um like about early optimism and like um, changing things so that, you know, the price is a bit more reasonable and then um, seeing if that was really the issue. And the, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of going, I kind of went through those two things too. Like, um, but yeah, like I started out being a, a, a business coach because I thought like, teaching English is not really like where it is for me in the long term, mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. like, you know, teaching communication. Like, I, I don't feel like it's, it's really like my strong point. And I feel like that's where this is going. Like with the whole like uh, ESL teaching, it's just okay. get better at like corporate being a corporate communicator and, and stuff like that. And, and mm -hmm. actually that's like, you know, ironically enough, that's what's like put it, turning me off my new niche as well is that um, like, you know, I, I changed it so that I have like my offer based on uh, something I'm passionate about. And then um, I don't know if it's like misalignment. So so my question for you is like, I don't know if it's if if, if I should be trying to um, fix the alignment between my offer and my program and like, uh, sorry, my offer and my niche. So like my program and my niche. Yeah. Um, or is it like, that I should um, just get better at sales because maybe it's the issue that I'm not communicating that value enough, uh, like you said. Great question. So I'm really happy you asked that because it's something I had to ask myself too. Is, is this my alignment or is it the, the sales skill? So there are a few things you can look at and I'll tell you exactly what I looked at. I noticed that I was still booking calls with my niche. So what that told me was the interest was still there. So the interest in my offer was there, the interest in the solution I was providing was there. However, they just weren't paying the price I was asking for. So once I identified that, okay, it's not a problem with the alignment. The alignment is fine. So it could be two things, my sales skills and where I'm actually targeting them. So it's Brazilians. Yeah, that's good, right? The solution. Yeah, they need it. My program is fixes their problems, but they just couldn't pay for it in that country. So that little shift there while working on my sales skills at the same time was able to get me 
get me back on track. So have a look at things like that is what I, I'd mentioned. Are you getting interest? Are people from this niche reaching out to you? Are they responding to your content? Are they messaging you on LinkedIn? Are they open to having calls uh, with you? If they are, your alignment could be okay. Now, if you're booking lots of calls, but no one is taking, uh, no one is buying the program at the price you would like, then there's just a skill gap in sales. So the good news is, hey, like a skill gap can be closed, right? We just need to work on it, level up, you know, find a coach, you know, practice with a friend, whatever you need to do to plug that skill gap. And every person who comes from that teaching background, almost every person, we all had those skill gaps. Teaching, hey, we might've had that nailed down, but we all had that, those skill gaps in marketing and sales. And we really need to plug those gaps if we want to succeed independently online in any any area, teaching or or otherwise. So kind of a long answer there. Uh, but yeah, the important thing is have a look at the metrics. Hey, if you're booking calls and you're not closing, it could be a sales skill gap. If you're not booking calls or not getting interest, it could be your marketing or it could be your alignment. So I'd take a closer look at, uh, at those areas. Okay. Yeah. That's given me a lot to think about. Okay. All right. Great stuff. Thanks for the Robbie, really, really Rob, stuff. Robbie, how do we make an appointment to talk to you for a few minutes? Outside? If you if you go to my LinkedIn profile at the top, uh, just under. I don't headline. even. I don't even have. I don't even know how to log into my LinkedIn. I uh, just uh just message me on Facebook then. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll copy it Thank into you. the chat. Okay. Thank you. Um, no worries, man. Cool. Uh oh, yeah. I think I sent that as a as a direct message. All right. I, let me just I, check. I have. I have it. I have your Facebook though. Great That's stuff. Right. Uh, I think there is there one hand up still here that i'm missing or no i think we're good wow 18 we're almost going two hours now that is unbelievable thank you so much for um yeah for joining me today i hope you got some value from this probably some stuff to think about but um all of you uh as long as you've registered it means i have your email so i'm going to be able to send you an email with a copy of the uh recording so everyone is gonna is gonna is gonna get that so yeah, thank you so much for joining here today. The questions are absolutely awesome. Uh, and yeah, I hope you got some value. Pretty ambitious, but I think we managed to cover all the all the main points. So uh, yeah, have, got, have an awesome day. Yeah. Thank you, Robbie. Yeah, you uh, too. Right. Total pleasure, all right? You know where to find me if you have any questions, right? Uh, just uh, yeah. Robbie can on LinkedIn. I'll put the link into the uh, into the chat. So yeah, don't ever hesitate to to reach out. I think you're one of the experts that would be best to have because you talk so fast. And so <laughs> you probably get a lot more value out of talking to you than many of the other experts in this, in James's program. Oh, Barry, you know, uh, one of the that, that was a cut, but that was a compliment, and not, not an insult. I know it was, but let me tell you, one of the notes I made to myself when I had a look, when I put these slides together, I was like, Robbie, you have a lot to get through, but don't go too quickly. Don't but talk But you didn't fast. go too quickly because I can. We, we can all listen faster than most people can speak. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy it was a, it was a good pace, but yeah, it was something I was I was conscious of before this. But uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you could uh, you could follow. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Any questions, reach out. My, my LinkedIn is in the chat. If you're interested in this offer, I've put the link in the chat and I'll also include it in the email so you can check it out. I've put some like previews and stuff there so you'll know exactly uh, what, you're, what you're getting. And uh, yeah, have an, have an awesome day. You too, Robbie. Bye, Bye everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.